<clears throat> Praise God. Before you sit down, look to the guy next to you and say, you look great in white. <laughs> be seated, please. Uh, I want to say a word to all the guys. Uh, don't just come in a white shirt, okay? Come with white pants. It look really good, okay? So if you don't have a white pants, go and get one. Uh, uh, we're going to come in white. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a great thing to just declare. And, and this is not to speak out against anything. It's to remind us of God's standard, to remind us that, you know, righteousness exhorts a nation. And that uh, when a nation, they don't have to be all Christian, but when they follow in the principles that God has laid for us, He will only bring blessings. So we want to be the light of this world and the salt of this earth. And therefore, we remind ourselves that it must first begin with us. Uh, why do we do that? Because there's something about uh, just preparing for that week and just going to get that white shirt and white pants and put it on. And of course, you know, there are many creative ways of doing it and make you look good. But, uh, but the very process itself forces you to think, why am I doing this? And, uh, and as you do this, it's a process of uh, aligning ourselves with the, with the purposes of God. I want to have a word of prayer so that God would really open our hearts for this very special message uh, this weekend, both over here as well as Suntec City. <clears throat> Let's pray together. Father, we just submit our hearts to you. We ask, Lord, that this word would find roots in our heart, that this word that comes from you will speak to us deeply. I ask that every word that will be spoken will be the very word of the Heavenly Father. We ask that you'll cover this place with the blood so that, Lord, you, your Holy Spirit would give us understanding so that the devil will not deceive us, will not use any filter to filter away the word of God, but that we will receive it in all its simplicity and clarity and the conviction of our hearts. And Lord, if there be someone here who does not know Jesus Christ as Saviour, I declare that this will be the day of salvation. Your word says if one sinner returns to you, the angels in heaven will rejoice. Lord, I pray that there will be somebody, somebody you, who will come to know Jesus in a personal way, whether here or in Suntec City. Father, Speak to us now in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Amen. At the beginning of this year and at the beginning of actually a couple of years, I'm part of a, what we call a global kingdom network partnership consisting of some of the key pastors around the world with significant ministry as well as marketplace ministers that have significant ministries around the world. One of them is Lord Emerson, who is a uh, in, in, in the House of Lords in the United Kingdom, have a great uh, en enterprise, and yet he's totally committed to the Lord and to make the name of the Lord known. And we come together to share best practices, to encourage each other. But this year, the meeting took place in Dubai, and uh, I was struck by the first devotion that was taken by one of my friends who is a pastor in the Philippines. His name is Pastor Tan Chi. He has now a 50,000-member church, and his next target is 75,000. And in, in that church, you just remember, he is bivocational. That means he's a full-time businessman. In fact, most of his pastors are his staff uh, uh, in the enterprise. And, uh, and, and, and God has really used him. And not only does he have... 50,000 in his church, he has got over 100 churches around the world, and God is using him mightily. And he said, you know, one of the things about sharing best practice is also sharing some of our biggest mistakes so that we will not make the same mistake again. And so he said, I look back at the many years of my ministry, and this is what he said, the greatest mistake I've ever made in all these years of ministry is in the wrong selection of key leaders under me. If I were to do it all over again, I've learned that I will only select people who are really broken. People who have experienced true brokenness. That's the only qualification for leadership. That struck me. And I've been thinking about it for many months and, I, and, and the message began to kind of weld up in my heart because as I listen to that and as I go through 
my life, my 40 years of ministry, and now this year is into my 41st and 42nd year, I realize that that's true. Any time when God can use me in some significant way or give me a new understanding about a ministry, it's always through a process of brokenness. So this weekend's message is entitled, The Blessing of Brokenness. The Blessing of Brokenness. Now, I know this title sounds like oxymoron. What has brokenness and blessing in common, except they all begin with B? But yet the Scripture says in Psalm 51, verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. In other words, God is saying that the kind of sacrifices or the kind of worship that's really acceptable, that brings delight to me and joy to me, are worships and, and sacrifices that come of a broken heart. And when you offer to me your broken heart, God says, I will never despise, I will never reject it, I will never kind of gloss over it. In fact, His promise in Psalm 34 verse 18 the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and save such as have a contrite spirit. In other words, if you come to me with a broken heart, I will draw near to you. That's God's promise. You see, this spirit is so opposite to what the world is saying. The world says, don't fix it until it's broken. God says, until you are broken, I cannot fix you. The Word says, don't use broken people. God says, I fix broken people. In fact, He says, I only use broken people. I feel compelled to preach this weekend. Actually, this weekend, I'm really swamped. I, mean, I just came back from uh, Mongolia and then just a few things, and I'm on my way to uh, Indonesia next week to preach in the Empire 21, and then I come back for a few days, and I'll be back in China. And, uh, but I just felt that the Lord said, do it. Uh, and I said, yeah, by faith, I do it. And, and God uh, has just birthed this in my heart because I feel I need to release it because we just enter into a 40 days of solemn assembly praying for revival, asking God to bless Singapore and asking God to open heaven and to pour out His blessings so that we will in this year, in the year follow, and in the years follow, see an opening of hearts and a great harvest of soul and, and, and thousands of disciples will be made for Jesus Christ. And, and that's our prayer. However, in order to see revival, in order to see the great move of God, the church of Jesus Christ must come to Him in brokenness of heart and spirit. We have to come to Him in total humility and say, God, we need You. Without You, we cannot do anything. We must come to Him in repentance, acknowledging that we have been proud, we have been, not been faithful to what God has called us to do. We have not been living right in the attitudes of our spirit, of our mind. Pastor Daniel just mentioned that, that verse that we have always quoted, and it is true. 2 Chronicles 7, 14, In my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal the land. Singapore needs much healing. Our divorce rate is on the rise. We have one of the most liberal law on abortion. Minors can go for abortion without the permission of the parents if you want to. This is where we are. We are among the most liberals in the world. Revival can only come when the people of God first come to Him and say, Lord, we take it upon ourselves. We have not been the salt of this earth. Forgive us for our sin. We're not there to condemn people. We're here to just take, let judgment begin with our own heart. Some time ago, I quoted Genesis chapter 7, 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep, the earth, in other words, was broken up and all the water began to rise. And when that happened, the windows of heavens were opened. I know this verse just simply described the coming of the flood in the days of Noah. But notice that there is a parallel here 
between a natural flood and the flood of the Holy Spirit, whereby the knowledge of God will cover the land like water cover the sea. Notice that before the windows of heaven were open, the foundation of the earth must be broken out and of its deep water swelled out. When the ground itself is broken up and the fountains of our tears welled up in our hearts in brokenness, the Lord then will open up heaven and pour out His blessing of revival. So this morning in this message, I'm just going to address this question. Why is brokenness so important? Why is it a prerequisite for the continual blessing of God in our life? Why is it that it takes brokenness to experience God's revival? I want to share with you two very important reasons. Reason number one, Brokenness is important because brokenness brings the presence of God. Because brokenness is coming to the point where we stand before God and we come to the absolute conviction that we are totally unworthy of God, but that He alone is worthy. That's brokenness. And when we come to the state where we actually realize how unworthy we are, we have no right to sit here if not for God's love. We have no right to claim any blessings from God. Anything that He gives is because He alone is worthy. We are unworthy of any blessing in our life apart from His great love and His great sacrifice for us. You see, the word brokenness refers to a state of surrender and defeat we experience when hardships come into our life, come into our usually steady and painless life. Now, no one enjoys the feeling of brokenness, but the powerful benefit it brings to our spiritual growth are immense. You see, being broken gives us a brand new perspective on the Lord's plan for our lives. You see, we are human beings bounded by earthly perceptions. Enjoying a steady stream of blessing has an, a very interesting effect on most of us. It distorts our view of the Father in heaven and of God, often leaving us to assume that God exists for us. We are egocentric. Remember the story, some of you have heard that, but let me repeat, I think it's an apt illustration. There's a difference between dog theology and cat theology. You know, you, if you have a dog at home, dog behave differently like cat. You t treat a dog well, where every time he's hungry, you feed him, he's not well, you take him to the vet and, and you make it comfortable and, and the dog begins to feel, boy, you know, everything I want, the master give it to me and everything I, I need, I have it. And when I am in trouble, the master take care of me. I mean, this is really good. My master is God. That's how dog thinks. But that's not how cat thinks. You do the same thing with a cat. You make sure the cat is comfortable. You love the cat. You cuddle the cat. If she, she wants to be cuddled, you feed her and you take care of her. And this is what a cat thinks. Wow, everything I want, I've got. I must be God. <laughs> and I think that most of us buy into a cat theology more often than a dog theology. Most of our relationship with God is confined to asking Him to bless us. We ask God for healing, for success, for financial security. Not that they are wrong, but we ask Him to bless our family, to bless our job, to bless our plans. We ask and we ask and ask. And if we are honest with ourselves, most of the time, we spend our prayer not really to talk to God at all. Think about it. We just come to God with a shopping list. Who is actually in the center of our prayer life and of our relationship with God? It may be shameful for some of us to realize that more often than not, we are at the center of that prayer. The end result is that subtle belief that God exists for our benefit. This distortion breaks the heart of God and leads us far away from truly knowing God as He is, the King and the Master and the Creator of our life who loves us immensely. And so when God sometimes in our lives says no, when He takes away instead of adding more, when He divinely manages what we have, how much we have, how long we have it, He's keeping us, He's helping us to keep our eyes on Him and Him alone. 
Do not despise this moment. Instead, dwell in humility and recognize that these feelings of brokenness as the voice of the Father calling us back to Himself into His loving arms. Listen, brokenness is the antidote to a self-centered life or a self-centered nature. This is why brokenness brings us into the presence of God. When we recognize that we are totally unworthy, so that when we walk into the presence of God, He alone is worthy, and we are consumed with Him and by Him. And as a result of that, we focus our hearts on Him. And when we do that, we will experience the presence of God beyond His gifts, beyond His blessing, beyond His healing, beyond His help, which we all recognize He has given to us but we draw near to Him and we delight in Him and we fall in love with Him. We fall in love with the giver and not just the gifts. And that's why brokenness is so important. This is why you will experience the presence of God deeper than any gifts or blessing can bestow upon you then you begin to be able to say like the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 1.8, you love him even though you have never seen him, though you do not see him now, you trust him and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. That the joy is not found in the toys, the joy is found in God the giver who has given his life for you and that you're unworthy of that greatest gift that God has given to us and that if he doesn't bless us anymore in our life, we will still owe him everything that we have. And that's why down the centuries, men and women that God really has used are people that God has broken. And our brokenness, we realize we are unworthy. And we realize that if you give off every cent we ever make, every second of our life, and everything we have in our family, including our family member, and sacrifice them on the altar for God, we have not given Him anything He has not first given to us, and we can never outgive the great sacrifice that is given to us on the cross when Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin on our behalf. We're so overwhelmed by His great love that we are willing to draw near to Him all the days of our life. And then the presence of God will surround us, fills us, occupies our heart and our mind all the days of our life. This was so with Apostle Peter. Peter was a man who always opens his mouth and stick his foot into it. He was a guy who said, Master, if everyone leaves you, I will never leave you. But before the sun was up, before the cock crows, he denied Jesus three times and Jesus looked at him and he wept bitterly. He became a broken man. And when he was broken, remember when the Holy Spirit came at the day of Pentecost, he was the one who stood up and he spoke of Christ and his resurrected power and 3,000 were added to the church when he first started. Thomas was the same. He was a smart aleck who always asked Clever question. You know, Jesus, you're the way, but I don't know the way. Where are you going? And when Jesus, after the resurrection, appeared to his disciples when he was not there, he said, I'm not going to believe unless I can feel the nail prints on his hand and feel the side of his body. And then a week or two later, Jesus appeared. And he said, son, come and feel my palm. Come and feel my side. And what does the Bible say? The Bible says he just fell before God and he said, my Lord and my God. And from that day onwards, Thomas became a broken man. And we hear so much about Western uh, uh, missions where Paul took the gospel to the West, but he was the founder of the Eastern mission. That's not heard very much in, in Scripture. He took the gospel all the way to India. And there were tablets found in India that referred to him as a Chinese because there is evidence that he brought the gospel to China, just that we don't have enough evidence. So at this moment, it remains a legend. There are many things that remain a legend until new uh, archaeological findings uh, come up. But he was a broken man, and God could use him. The great apostle Paul, he was the same. 
Romans 7, verse 21, 24. Can you remember? This is the Apostle Paul who wrote most of the New Testament, who gave profound exposition about the doctrine of, of salvation and of justification and, and had profound argument for the, for the gospel. And God used him to turn the world upside down. And this is what he said. I have discovered this principle of life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law within my heart, but there's another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to sin and still, uh, and is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? The Apostle Paul understand he has no righteousness of his own. He cannot... Attain it even if he tries. But of course, that led him to Romans chapter 8 where he talks about there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus and that we have been set free by the Spirit of God to live for God, the whole understanding of the freedom in the Spirit. And because he knew that, when he wrote to his son in the faith, 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 15, he said, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of it. Do you understand the mentality of Paul? I mean, this great man who had done great work, this great man who come down in history as one of the greatest apostles ever known in the, in, in the story of Christianity, and yet he said, I am the worst of all sinners. He said, when you come to the set of mine, then there's no spirit of entitlement. You know, we feel like we are entitled. You're not entitled. The only entitlement you have is eternity in hell. You know, people come to me and say, it's not fair. It's not fair. God is not fair. Let me just get it right. Okay, get, get this straight right. God is not fair. Understand that? Tell the guy next to you, God is not fair. You know why? Because if God is fair, all of us will be in hell. The only fair thing for God is that we spend eternity in unending torment because of our sin against God. The greatest and the most unfair thing God has ever done is He sent His Son to die for us on the cross. The one who knew no sin becomes sin on our behalf. Is that fair? That is totally unfair. But God is just. Because He has done this for us, He will forgive us on the basis of what Jesus has done. So don't argue about fairness with God. We're totally unworthy. When you understand that, now it's one thing to hear it from me. I pray that the Holy Spirit will just really impress upon you because we have this spirit of entitlement. Don't get me wrong. God wants to bless us. God loves to bless us. But sometimes we go to the wrong source. The blessing comes from God, not the blessing itself. And when you're totally broken, you begin to experience the presence of God. And you experience joy unspeakable. David is the same thing. He sinned against God. He's like, uns- ah, I just recently meditated about his sin. I said, it's terrible. This guy is so terrible. I mean, he took his most, fa- his most faithful servant, Uriah, and he bedded his wife. Then the wife got pregnant. Now he said, how to cover up? Well, maybe this is what I do. I bring back my faithful servant who will come home in the midst of war, let him rest a few days, he surely will have fun with his wife. Now we can explain the the pregnancy. Little did he know, this man was so faithful, he came back hoping to get some instruction from, from the master and he refused to go into his own house. And David said, you're foiling my plan. Of course, he didn't say that. And then David said, why don't you go in and just have a rest? He says, no, because there's a war going on. We're fighting a battle for you, master. How can I go and have fun with my wife? Gee. I mean, you can't get a more faithful servant. And you know what he did? He murdered him. And when he was exposed, I mean, this this man really, I mean, he's a, a piece of dirt, man. And his heart was broken in spite of all that God has done for him. And then he cried out to God in Psalm 51, Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. I need your presence, O God. I realize I really, really messed it up. 
Then he realized that no matter what he does, he's not going to come back. He can offer to God a thousand bulls and cattle. He can offer to God in his riches everything he has. But then that's when he uttered that word in verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite spirit or heart. The Lord will not despise. You know, the reason this message meant so much to me, because after hearing this, I went back and I think, and I began to recall everything that has gone on in my life. And I realized that every time God could use me, He had to take me through a season of brokenness. I came to know the Lord in secondary one, on fire for God, led my classmates to Christ, went to this church, and they recognized that fervor and that reality of what God has done in my life. And, and I began to be very ex- involved in the ministry. I became the president of a youth group, and, uh, and I grew in the church. And I believe God can use me greatly. But I have a problem. I have a bad relationship with my mother. Because my father died when I was in primary four, and my mother just didn't know what to do with me. And to be honest, I'm just a bit of a rebel, as you can, as you have known, if you've seen me. And uh, so it's not easy to be my mother. <laughs> and she had no, no one to, to, to help. So, so she was really strict on me. I mean, she would put me on a chair, and, you know, I remember we, we learned spelling, and she would use a cane, and she asked, how do you spell this? And if I'm wrong, <laughs> the whole day like that. And even when I go to the toilet, she would be sitting outside the toilet. Okay, take it, I, because she said, you must do well. I had a rough time with him, her. And even after being a Christian, I, I couldn't square it. I, I fight with her all the time. And then she would threaten me emotionally. She said, you know, your mother now has high blood pressure. And every time I have a fight with him at night, he says, tonight, I want to tell you this. Because you're such a terrible son. When I sleep, I'm going to die with stroke and I will never wake up again. And you know, as a, as a as a teenager, 12, 13 year old, this is very scary. And I remember I couldn't sleep at night. I would wake up in the middle of the night. I would go to my mother's bed and just stand and say, did she die or not? I honestly, and I would just stand there until she turns and I say, oh God, sorry, I make her angry. She didn't die. I, I did that almost every night. And it was, it was such a painful experience in my life. And I began to just, and, and I shared with you, and uh, I, I, I don't like to talk a lot about this. And last night I didn't even say it, and Daniel came out and said, You should say it. So many of the young people here never hear your story. Maybe you heard it a thousand times, but some of you not heard it. And during the, the O level year, I mean, she came to me and she said, I want you to know you are the oldest son. If you fail O level, this is what I'll do I will kill your brother and your sister, and I'll commit suicide. And the blood of three members of the family will be in your hand. For goodness sake, I was 16 years old. And you just don't understand those words. Those, they are really heavy. And I tell you, it, it was such a, a tough time. But it was in that year that I really was broken. I came before God and I, I began to say, and I, I couldn't take it anymore. I said, God, I, I don't even worry whether I pass or fail. I just want to do the old level to the glory of God. Just help me. Just help me to discipline my life, to do what I need for the glory of God. And it was in that year, one night, when I was just going to bed reading the Word of God, and I heard the voice of God calling me to be a pastor. And I got on my knees and I said, God, I don't know what that means, but I'm willing. That was one of the highlights of, uh, of my life because I felt the presence of God, because all that I'm facing just drove me to God. I got no other alternative. And it was then I was called. You see, I tell you, brokenness brings us into the presence of God. I, I, I'm not, you know, brokenness is not, is not self-doubt. Brokenness is not inferiority complex. Inferiority complex has a lot to do with the ego. Brokenness is you come to the end of the road and you have nothing else you can do and to offer you're kind of pinned to the corner and God just somehow allow it so that the only way is God, but God comes to be so real. 
And it was years later, I backslided, but when I came back to the Lord, the Lord pointed me back to that night. I can see it as vividly as I could in that bed, and I felt the presence of God. And I know I'm called to the ministry. You know, there are some of us are going through that, and it's not always because of sin. Sometimes it's sin that God needs to deal with you so that He will not eat you up and destroy you if you just let its ugly head keep on rearing itself. Or it may be just a season you don't even know why. It's not because of what you have done, but, but, but just external, extraneous forces begin to kind of bring you to the end of yourself. It may be a sickness. It may be some problems in your work or family relationship. I want to tell you this. I mean, in a almost... Uh, uh, Almost, you would think it's a sadistic way, but it's not. I would say congratulations. God is bringing you to Himself. How many people in our church would testify that if not for that broken relationship, if not for that illness, if not for that, that most difficult challenge in your life, you would not be sitting in church today, but God brought you here. And now you discover that He is far greater than all these problems. Amen. So why is brokenness so important? Brokenness usher in the presence of God. When you truly understand that there is no entitlement in your life, you are totally unworthy and God alone is worthy. There's a second reason, which is a build-up of the first. The first reason why brokenness is so important because it brings the presence of God when you realize you are unworthy, God alone is worthy and that you're not entitled to anything, but that God is gracious to give you everything. But number two, the second reason is brokenness brings therefore the presence of God when you come to a point where you say, I am totally unable, but He alone is able. You know, there are people who look at me and say, Pastor Kong, you're very gifted. You can do things. You can do magic show. You can play polo. You can do this. I tell you, gifted people has a big problem. It's with ego. How do you be gifted and you know that you're not able? <laughs> In a sense, I'm able. <laughs> you may be able to do something, but you're unable to do that which really counts for eternity if not for the goodness of God. And God has to break people with a big ego so that it will be offered on the altar so that now God can do exceeding abundantly beyond what you could ask or think. We need to be broken. If, if we're not broken, all we could do is what our gifts enable us to do. But when we're broken, we can go far beyond that and we will say like the prophet Zechariah in Zechariah 4, 6, that is not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. It's when we are broken, we experience in Psalm 34, the Lord is near those who have a broken heart and saved such as with a contrite spirit. And the Lord comes in and do that which is far beyond what we can ask or think. When the Lord is near us, when we are broken, we experience not just the presence of God, but the power of God. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead. That power that is experienced by John the Baptist when he saw Jesus, the Messiah, he said, He must increase and I must decrease. This is the brokenness that brings the power of God. I have a favorite speaker and writer in my era, at least. His name is Dr. Charles Sunda. I remember in the Years when I pastor FCBC and preach every week, I take a lot from him. I read all his book. I, I still have all his book on my shelf. I mean, I've thrown away. I mean, we can't keep all the books we have. have. Sometimes we give it away, throw it away. But these books remain, and now they're all dog-eared and browned and dirty, but I, I, just, I just refer to it. He was one time the president of Dallas Theological Seminary after we have, I've left the seminary for many years. And I think he really brought a lot of blessing. And one of his book, he made this statement. He said, when God wants to do an impossible task, he takes an impossible individual and crushes him. And crushes him. That's the qualification. All the examples I've quoted, Peter, Thomas, 
Paul and even David were mighty men God can use because God crushed them. I'm amazed at David. I'm amazed at the terrible thing he has done. But God broke his heart. So the final commentary of David's life is still good. In Acts chapter 13, we just read it in our quiet time just maybe a week or so ago. Okay, this is what God said. For David, after he has served the purpose of God in his generation, fell asleep. I pray that this will be on my epitaph. Isn't that great? Here lies Lawrence Kong. He served his generation and he fell asleep. I think that's it. But God used him. God used him more than any other king that he has used. And God's commentary of him is still in verse 22 of of Acts uh, uh, 13. I have found David as the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do my will. But just remember, even when he was anointed to be king, when Nathan, the prophet, anointed him king, it took him many years before he was king. And throughout those years, he was running for his life. Saul was jealous of him, and Saul wanted to kill him. And God tested him at one point that he could have killed Saul, who had been looking out to kill him. And he said, I will not touch the anointed of God because I don't have the authority, in spite of how evil he is. And because of that brokenness, and for years he was in the wilderness with a bunch of rebel people, broken people, people who could not fit in anywhere, and he worked with this group of people all these years who became his mighty man. Because God broke him. And then he could be a king used by God. I said to you, one of the biggest... one of the biggest problems in any ministry, if God wants to use you, whether you're a cell leader or not, is pride. That is part of the occupational hazard of the ministry. Because whenever God uses you, you hear a fantastic testimony, and you felt, wow, so good, and you say, I got one more feather in the cap, rather than throwing the crown at the foot of Jesus and say, thou art worthy to receive glory and honor and praise. And so God just got to break up that pride, break up that ego. You know why? Because 1 Peter chapter 5 says, God opposes the proud but favors the humble. So humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and at the right time, He will lift you up in honor. Pride. You know, God says, I oppose the proud. Now, it's scary enough if God doesn't help you. You pray to God, God says, I don't help you. Well, that's bad enough. But when God puts in writing and says, now I will oppose you. Man, I don't want to get there. And what is that that will cause us to get there? Nothing but pride. And God needs to do something in our life before He can use us. Otherwise, we'll be destroyed. It was Martin Luther who said, God creates out of nothing. Therefore, until a man is nothing, God can make nothing out of him. And that's why we need to cry out for a new level of brokenness. The Church of Jesus Christ in Singapore needs to cry out for a new level of brokenness. And I want to say this to you. If you're going through a tough time in your life, it's God's loving hand that is drawing you to Himself. And He wants to use you. He wants you to graduate with flying colors. He wants you to be able to hear His voice and say, Well done. Well done, you passed the test. Now, I can give you more. Now, again, I trust you with more life. When you come to the point where you say, Lord, without you, we are nothing. And without you, we cannot do anything. That God began to use you. I I can give all sorts of examples, but I want to share this is what happened to me in my life. When I knelt down that night and told the Lord, Lord, you called me to be a pastor, my answer is that I don't understand what that is, but I'm willing. And you know that year, I did exceptionally well in my O level. I mean, so well that I was selected to be part of the elitist group in the first National Junior College. 
Now, I know this is kind of history for most of you. Ah, junior college, no big deal. But it was the first junior college, and, and it was the talk of the town. And, uh, and, and, and I was from SGI. If you leave SGI, you're not a lawyer, SG, SG, uh, uh, Josephian, all right? But, but everybody said, yeah, I've been in this new experimental uh, uh, process, and uh, only the best could get in. I was like, and I went in, and praise God, the be- biggest blessing of that experience is I met my wife, Nina, but you know, that's God's blessing. But uh, I, I led a, a Christian group in there, but I become proud. And after a while, I just begin to slack. I, and then when I went into the army, I completely gave up God. I, I, I started reading secular philosophy, and I began to, uh, my favorite book is uh, uh, Burton Russell. I think, uh, why, don't I, why, why do I not believe in God? And, and I thought I was really a smart guy. And, uh, and when, when I went to army, I just, just do whatever I want, and I live the way I want. I came to the point that I will persecute Christians. You know why so one of the pastor, uh, one of the guy I persecuted uh, is, is Pastor Patrick Cole. I don't know whether he's around today, but he was in the same battery with me, and I was a sergeant major, okay? I was a BSM, and uh, I hate Christians. And, and I, I came to a point where, where and, and I couldn't stand Pastor Patrick because he was the only guy in the whole battery that would not use the four-letter word. How can any respectable soldier don't use the four-letter word? <laughs> what kind of man are you? So I just make him do that, but he will not, not do it, and he will just gently not do it. And, and so I give him a hard, hard time. He make the first, he, he make the first mistake. I said, take three. Take three means three weekends confinement, <laughs> right? But I tell you something. It was after I left the army, went to university, came back to the army for the last remaining time where I, I was deferred to go into that year. And God broke my heart with an experience, which is another story to tell you. I have no time, all right? But then I remember there was a man by the name of Patrick Cole who doesn't use four-letter words. And he will not budge, no matter what pressure. You know, it's amazing what God can do. And he's not exactly the biggest preacher uh, in the world, but God used him. But my heart was broken. I went to a retreat with my girlfriend, who is called Nina Thor. <laughs> and I went there. After the second day, the camp commandant wanted to throw me out because at night, I was found gambling. <laughs> you know, when lights off, I turned on the thing. This is what I do. <laughs> you know, gamble. And, and I'm quite good with my hands. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and they said, you know, Lawrence, I, we love you. You used to be a member of church, but if you don't do this, you break the law. Yeah. But something happened. A boy died. A little boy died. And I saw how the Christian, in spite of all the pain in their heart, began to come and, and, and rest in the Lord. In fact, the camp commandant said, oh, it is incredible. How do we answer to the parents? The parents didn't even go to that, that, that uh, retreat in Port Dixon and, and, and just trusted the church and we went out swimming, came back, and couldn't find him, and then we, and he was drowned. And, and yet, the camp commandant said, let's kneel before the Lord. Can we do something right now? Let's thank God for what happened, because the Bible says, in all things give thanks. Let me tell you, that really got to me. I mean, this, this guy must be out of his mind. I mean, who is he? Well, he, he, he's just a chairman of... Uh, MRT in Singapore for many years, okay? Uh, so he's not, a, he's not a fly-by-night guy, okay? And all of a sudden, it hits me in the face that there's a group of people who knows the reality of God, so real that even in the midst of such terrible thing that he could, he or, and the people could give thanks. I, woke, I went back, I went back to my barrack. I walk up and down. I walk up and down. I was fighting with God. I said, God, I give you a try. You know, I could never love my mother. And I had such a hard time. And that's why I just, my life is in a mess. And I can do anything my want. But I tell you, I don't like what I, I, who I am. But, but I've tried you. And you know, and, and I just went back and forth. And finally, I got on my knees. And I said, God. At that time, I love to gamble. I, I'm a, I, I don't understand why people would do this, you know. I said, I'm going to know. No challenge at all, just go. 
I love to play poker because poker is a good game. You know, you can, you know when to bet. You know, it's like, you know, poker is just like the stock market. But, uh, uh, and you know when to buy when, and you're, you've got a bad hand, you know how to cut your losses. So I think that's a very thinking game. And I tell you, and I got on my knees and I know the only language I have. I said, Lord, this is my final bet. <laughs> I'm betting my life on you. I offer you nothing. I am terrible. I don't know how to do it. I was a chain smoker. I, I don't know. My life is in a mess. But Lord, I'm betting my life on you. And I have no promises I can give you. I cannot promise you I'll be a great person. But all I know is I need you. And I gave my life to the Lord afresh. And from that day, there was no turning back. And a few months when I went to the church, the Lord changed me. The church was, was of course, thankful. They've been praying for me for years. And, and then God brought me back to the place I was called to be a pastor. And from that day on, there's no turning back. I can keep on telling you a story. FCBC was birthed out of brokenness. I grew up in the church. That church meant so much to me. That was the only church I've been in my life. But when I spoke in tongues, they completely abandoned me. They challenged me. They, they, I, I didn't know what to do. And at the time, I wasn't even confident of my theology. And, and then that was the other most painful time of my life until I surrendered myself to God. And when I was fired, FCBC was started. I tell this story all the time in faith community Bible school. You know why? Because I need the new members to understand that this church was not an accident. This church was built by God. Because I'm not the kind of guy who just run from church to church. I will always be faithful to one church. If they have not fired me, I will still be there. But God had other plans. But it was so broken. I was so broken. My, my, my wife had a miscarriage. And, and I, I cannot even begin to say how broken I am. I lost all confidence in my own leadership. I lost confidence in myself. I don't even know what is right, what is wrong. But out of that, FCBC was started. And from that point onwards, I know that whenever God wants to use me, He will break my heart. He will find something that will just choke me. You know, one of the biggest heartbreaking experience is when God called me into the arts and entertainment I started to do this magic show. You know why people don't understand? My closest people, many of you don't understand. You don't understand why I do. I'm going to preach a message on that. And my people say, once in a year, you need to preach a message on that to remind them of what we're doing. This is part of a church. Why, the, why we will build a theater? You don't understand. But God called me and I tell you, if I succeeded, you know, after 70 years, 17 years, oh, yeah, about that, what have you done? I tell you, we are moving along. If I have succeeded in the first day, I want to tell you this, I'll be too proud. I will have fallen because there's a very dangerous world. Yeah. But God has to teach me, make mistake after mistake. Not that I purposely did it, I just don't know what to do and no one is there to tell me what to do. No one has done that. Very few people, I don't know anyone in the world where the pastor himself, the senior pastor of a church, go in and become a clown, not a clown, an artist. <laughs> I want to tell you this, I'm still in the process of brokenness. But there's a joy in my heart because I just do what God has called me to do. He alone is able I'm not able. And now maybe God has prepared me to do things that are quite impossible. And God began to use me. Maybe my journey must be the journey of FCBC. Maybe God needs to give us a new level of brokenness so that our eyes will not be comparing. Why these other churches are like that, I'm like that. Uh, how come we do things like that? How come we can't explain? How come Pastor Kong is you know, fighting battles that no one has fought? Well, I don't know. I, I don't even expect what the rest will do. I just do what God has called me to do. But I tell you something. I know and I know that God is with me. I have a great freedom. You know, I'm tired. I, it's, it's not easy. I go from one place to another. I live out of a suitcase. But you know, I just know God is with me. And I know that this church is chosen by God for some special thing. Some special thing. But you must recognize that the calling of God in my life is the calling of God in this church. 
because God used me to birth this church. And if you will just ask God how I can fit in, how I can begin to grow, I came back from Mongolia. It's exciting. The biggest churches in Mongolia are G12 churches. <laughs> Amen. I got one follower here. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> this year, I can't make it to the Korean G12 conference. This year, in their conference, they will have 12,000. And half and more of them are young people. I can't go because I got other commitments. But I sent my better renewed model called Daniel Kong. <laughs> Improved model. Church, God specializes in using broken people. That's the only qualification. It's not your gifting. God knows your gifting. He will never use someone he is not gifted. He use you to do something you're not gifted for. So don't worry. God is the greatest HR director. I always believe in that. He knows how to use people in the right place. So he'll never give you a job that he doesn't plan, you know, he's not wired you for. But I tell you, it is a joy. Brokenness brings the presence of God. Brokenness brings the power of God. And that's why Paul says that this treasure is put in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. I want to conclude by saying something to those who may be sitting here who have never given your life to Jesus Christ. You say, wow, that doesn't sound like a gospel. The gospel is good news. You mean I'm going to come in there, I'm going to be broken. <laughs> Maybe you are here because you are broken. You see, the good news is God fixed broken things and broken life. And if you allow brokenness to happen in your life because you've got a greater, greater plan for you, something that you alone can do that no one else can, but God wants that yieldedness because you know that in yielding to Him, when you are no longer God and He is God in your life, you can see and experience and do much more than you've ever experienced. And perhaps some of you are sitting out here because a friend brought you and because you come, because there is a need in your life, there's something that, that, that is troubling you. Maybe that's that brokenness God is using so that you can experience the presence of God. It may be a sickness in your family. It may be just a problem in your job. It may be a relational issue that, that just overwhelms you, that, that takes the better out of you. And, and whatever it is, but you do not know Jesus, you're sitting here and God is saying to you, come, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come, and you'll find rest to your soul when you come and rest in my presence and in my power. Because you cannot do anything for yourself. I've done everything for you because I never ask my people to do something that I've not done. And I've done what I ask you to do. I am a broken God. Do you know that in the Lord's Supper, this is what we say. When a bread is broken, Jesus says, take eat, for this is my body broken for you. God broke His heart. He died of a broken heart for the sins of the world. The God who knew no sin became sin on our behalf so that we may have the righteousness of God. So this morning, if there's somebody, you, sitting here who is not sure that you are a Christian, you might have come to church, but you have just never come to a point where you say, God, this is the day I give my life to Jesus. Or this is the first time you're in the church and, and, and God has spoken to you. Then the Lord says, as many as receive me, to them give the authority to become the sons of God, even to those who believe on His name. Those who are sitting out there, right there in, in uh, Suntech City, that there's a brokenness in your heart and God is using that to draw you. Otherwise, you will never feel the need of God. But today, instead of fighting God, asking God, why? Why don't you come to the solution who is God Himself? God wants to draw near to you and He wants to be a help to you. 
He died for you. And if God has spoken to you, open your heart to receive Him. In a moment, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. That prayer is designed for those who want to accept Jesus Christ. Surrender your life. Thank Him for He died for your sin on the cross and He resurrected and broke the power of sin. And you want to receive in your life, you want to commit your life to Him. I will lead you in the prayer. If you have never said this prayer before, follow me line by line, word for word. Articulate that word. Speak it out. Because the Bible says you must confess with your mouth and believe in your heart so that you can be saved. Your mouth and your heart must align. When you speak out, there's power in words. So when I lead you in the prayer, follow me line by line, but mean it in your heart. And as you're praying for the first time because you've never done it before, I want the family of God, every Christian to join in, whether here or in Suntec City, so that they can accompany you as you take this step of salvation. Don't say tomorrow I will do it. We never know about tomorrow. The Bible says this is the day of salvation. Do it now. Shall we all bow before God? Close our eyes, bow before God, and let's pray. No one moving around. Lord, I ask that if there be somebody who come in here asking for an answer, but God, Holy Spirit, draw them to yourself because you love them and died for their sin. Every head is bowed, every eye closed, including those in Sundex City. I'm going to lead you in their prayer. If you have never prayed that prayer before, follow after me. And will all the Christians join in to accompany this person? Let's pray together. Dear Father in heaven, Dear Father Father in heaven, heaven, thank you for your love. Thank you for your love. Thank you for sending Jesus Christ. Thank you for sending Jesus Christ to die for my sin. To die for my sins. Dear Lord Jesus, Dear Lord Jesus, I come before you today. I come before you today. I open my heart to you. I open my heart to you. I offer to you the brokenness of my heart. I offer to you the brokenness of my heart. I invite you to come in. I invite you to come in. Be my master. Be my master. Be my Lord. Be my Lord. Forgive my sins. Forgive my sins. Cleanse my heart. Cleanse my heart. And help me, Lord. And help me, Lord. To follow you. To follow you. All the days of my life. All the days of my life. I renounce every other God I have worshipped in the past. I renounce every other God I have worshipped in the past. I will worship you alone. I will worship you alone. Please come into my life. Please come into my life. And make me a child of God. And make me a child of God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I want every head bowed, every eye closed. No one moving around except those on duty. This is a sacred moment. If you pray that prayer just now with all your heart, I want to congratulate you. Your sins are forgiven because of that step of faith. And I want to pray a blessing for you. I want to just speak on behalf of God that your sins are forgiven. You are now a child of God. I want to know who you are. So it doesn't matter where you're sitting, wherever you are, in this auditorium or in Suntec City, I'm going to count to three. And when I count to three, one, two, and three, if you pray that prayer in your heart, or you, you, I know you didn't shout it out loud, but, but you kind of mouthed it and, and mean it in your heart. If you did that, I want to pray a blessing for you. Once I count to three, I want you to raise your hand. And don't put it down until I pray for you. You don't need to lift up your head. You don't need to open your eyes. And no one else is looking around except for those who are on duty. As you lift up your hand, you are saying, Pastor Kong, I mean what I say. I follow that prayer. And I invited Jesus in my life. Please pray a blessing for me. I'll be delighted to do so. So I'm going to count. One, two, and three. And if you did that, whether you're in Suntec City or here, raise your hand and don't put it down until I pray for you. I'm going to count right now. One, two, three. Raise your hand right now. Raise your hand high. Raise it higher. Okay? Raise it higher. Raise it high because before you come in today, you didn't give your life to Christ. But today, for the first time, you give your life to Christ. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. I see your hand. I see your hand. Though, right there in Suntec City, I see your hand. I see your hand. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to pray for you right now. Lord, I just speak on the authority of your word, that if anyone receives you, they become the sons and the daughters of God, that their sins are forgiven and they become a child of God. I now bless you to understand what it is to have your sin forgiven. And the Lord says to you, you are my son, you are my daughter. I welcome you into my family. Thank you, Lord. Bless them in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Let's stand up and just give God a big round of applause. Let's stand up and thank the Lord. Everyone, can you do that? Now this is what I want to do. I want to welcome the people who have made that decision. You may be in the sun next city. You may be out there. You lifted up your hand. Some of you, I know you prayed that prayer, but you just didn't lift up. I tell you, when you see the people coming forward, you join them. I'm going to come to three. If you lift up your hand just now, when I come to three, I want you to take your belongings, leave your seat, and the friend that brought you will be very happy to do that. I want you to come forward here. You know why? Because when you make the decision, it's a personal decision. But once you make the decision, you are part of our family. And we want the whole family to pray for you. The Bible says, if you are not ashamed of me before man, I will not be ashamed of you before my father. Don't worry, take that step. Just remember, every step you take, the Lord has take, taken a thousand steps towards you when He died on the cross. So, as I come to three, straight away come forward. You know, uh, you brought a friend who doesn't know Jesus Christ. Turn to the person and say, if you want to give your life to Christ, I'll be happy to accompany you. And come and let them experience God. On account of three. One, two, three. Let's welcome them. Come on, we're going to wait. Church, let's welcome them. You come. And I, there are some on top. And, and, and some in and Suntec City. I want you to come. This is the day of salvation. This is the day of salvation. <laughs> this is the day of salvation. Come. Come, we wait for you. Even if you didn't raise your hand just now, but, but the Lord has spoken to you, you come. And those in uh, Suntax City, you come. God says, I will never leave you or forsake you. Praise God. I, I just want to say a word to all of you. When you make that simple step of faith, it looks too simple to be true. You know, many times, you know, like you press the computer, you press things, things will happen. Well, it's very simple for you. You just press the button. But God has done so much. God has done everything. He died for our sin. And when you give your life to Christ, you know what happened? The Lord says you're born again into the family of God. And that means it doesn't matter whether you're old or you're young. As of this point, if this is the first time you make up your mind to give your life to Christ, you are a spiritual baby. A spiritual baby have eyes don't see very clearly. They have fingers that they can't use, legs that don't walk very well. But, but there's life. Given time, the baby will understand and experience. And that's why a baby needs a family. And we are your family. We're not perfect. We're just like you. All of us at one point just took that step. But God has changed our life. So that's why I bring you forward so the whole church will bless you. And after that, a pastor will lead you to a room outside so that they will give you some of the materials so that you can kind of be able to give us a chance to walk with you so that you experience God. And that includes those who have come forward in uh, Suntec City. So let's raise our hands and let's pray for them. Lord, bless them. Bless their work. Bless their marriage. Bless their health. And Lord, draw near to them as they take this step. Let them experience your presence. And in, in, the, in the days and in the months ahead, let them begin to discover the fullness of joy in Jesus Christ, the truth of what you have done. And let them be able to become overcomers in their life over issues that they have to deal with and, and problems that brings them pain or, or difficulty. Let them know how real you are, how good a God you are, so that they are ready to grow, to become all that you have designed them to be. Bless them, Lord, and make them a blessing to many. We thank you for them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's turn around, follow the pastor, follow Pastor Simon, whose hand is up. But we, we're going to pray. Today we're going to praise God. Come on, give them a big round of applause. I know I'm kind of running a bit out of time, but I'm pushing for it. Today we just want to pray for broken people, for a Christian who have to admit it doesn't matter whether you're 
great success outside or you're just a very simple person who live an ordinary life. But you know you're broken. And you just need to surrender your brokenness to God instead of just getting upset. I, I look through some of you. I, I see some of you I prayed for years ago. Broken marriages. And now you're doing well. Bankruptcy. And now God has given you a second chance. Whatever that brokenness is. You come forward and lay that broken heart on the altar. You know? And God says He will not despise you. He will not laugh at you. He will not say, what is, why are you so so stupid, you know, just being broken over such small things. <laughs> He's not such a God. He knows us. He loves us. He understands us. I have Father. And you come and you say, Lord, I just want to believe. I just want to offer this broken heart. I can't. It's just like me when I came to God. I have no promises. I said, I know. My life is in a mess. I, I can make a decision now to never do this. I will do it immediately. But I just come and offer my broken heart to God. And God specializes in healing broken hearts, in rebuilding broken lives, in putting back those pieces in our life so that He will get the glory and you will have the joy of seeing the fullness of life and of God. Here are some words. There's a man in bluish green checkered shirt who wants to quit smoking I saw this person, this intercessor saw a smoke-filled heart that is just, but has been touched by God. So you come, God can touch you. And, and there's some, someone here that you just know that you've lost the fire for the Lord and, and you're broken over this lukewarmness. You want to get out of it. You want to just be on fire like what you do. God can help you. Just, just tell God what you can't do and say, Lord, but I surrender this to you. Offer that as an order. Uh, offering to the Lord, all right? And um, you're serving God's ministry, facing many challenges, you feel like giving up. The Lord says, press on. Let me tell you this, I feel like giving up all the time. <laughs> all the time. Uh, and the only thing that causes me to press on is, I know God has spoken. I know God is in this. I just press on. So come, do not be afraid for I'm gentle. Some of you are, there's fear in your heart. There's fear that, that God will turn you off, uh, turn you away, but God will not. I saw God put a seal on a heart and, a, and, and the mark is alive and burning. It's about consecration of our heart. Maybe as I spoke, God felt, you feel like God wants you to reconsecrate your heart to God again. And then you will see the breakthrough. You will see God's blessing in your heart. You know, brokenness is not just an occurrence. It's a basic attitude of our hearts. But we got come to God and say, I'm not worthy, you alone are worthy. I'm not able, you alone are able. And it's with that state of mind, because God, Jesus, Paul says this, that death is always at work within us, so that life may be at work within the people he served. It's a state of mind. It's a constant posture before God. Except that when you learn your lesson, God doesn't have to break you. You know how broken you are. And you become the best candidate for God to use you. Then you dare to do things that you don't fully understand. You dare to take steps when you have to pay a price for it because a price is paid by Jesus on Calvary. So I want to speak a blessing to you. Lord, I just pray that we will be a humble people. Forgive us for our spirit of entitlement. Lord, we are entitled only to condemnation apart from the cross. And Lord, when we are set free from that, we enter into your throne room and there find grace and mercy at a time of need. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that there's nothing you cannot fix in our life. That even when things are gone, God, you can take that and multiply our life to be a blessing. So Lord, let this be a turning point in the lives of this church. A new level of brokenness so that there will be a new level of glory. So that when the alabaster jar is broken, the perfume of the blessings and the fragrance of God might rise up 
through your people. Thank you, Lord, for this word in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's thank the Lord. Let's thank the Lord. Let's thank the Lord.